Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me ask you a question. Have you ever noticed that what you wear has the power to change how you feel? Project Endure Apparel is designed to remind you that easy won't make you stronger and that growth is an uncomfortable choice that we all have the privilege to make every day. Look good, feel good, and perform good. Head to the link in the show notes to shop Project Endure Apparel and keep on doing hard things. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 63. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very special guest in New York, Stephen Eisen. Stephen, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show, Joe. Of course, man. I'm excited for this conversation, and we might as well jump right in, and you can give me a little bit more background on you as well as our audience, but uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah. Originally from Boston. Um went to Cornell for college. And uh, I guess that's where the story begins. Uh, My freshman year, I was on vacation with my family and friends, just really thinking about how lucky I was to be there. Um, But that week, my grandfather was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And growing up, he was a huge part of my life. He drove me to school every day as a kid. Uh, He taught me to play golf and pool. And so there's someone I was really close to. And that news really just like brought me to a low in my life. Um, And it got me thinking about the highs and lows that I was going through um, so close together and how everyone goes through highs and lows. You know, it doesn't matter your age, demographic, uh, income level, like we all have highs and lows. And so I was like, okay, well, what are the highest and lowest points on earth? Mount Everest and the Dead Sea. And how could I take elements from those two places and incorporate them in a product that people can wear every day as a reminder to find balance in life? Staying humble when you're on top of the world and hopeful when you've hit a low. So every low Kai bracelet, which is the first company that I started, uh, has a white ball with water from Mount Everest in it and a black ball with mud from the Dead Sea to remind you to stay balanced every day. All right. So we've got a lot to talk about. This is going to be a good one. Um, Before we go there, though, you're from Boston. Does that make you a Red Sox fan? More, I'd consider myself more of a football fan, I guess. But... um, yeah, I mean, Boston sports run in my blood. Uh, I could never wear a Yankees hat. or I, I, I'll live here maybe for, even though I lived here for the rest of my life, I'll never put a Yankees hat on. But I think I do have to let my kids be New York sports fans. That's fair. As, as someone who grew up rooting for all the New York sports teams, um, I respect your decision to stay loyal to Boston. Um, so we'll, we'll get along for the sake of this podcast and outside of it, I'm sure. But, um, but yeah, man. So, all right, I've, I have a practical question. So for, for the low Kai bracelets, how do you get the water from Mount Everest and the materials from the black sea? Like, what is that process like? Yeah. So the mud from the dead sea is easy. Um, cause they make a lot of beauty products out of mud from the dead sea. I wouldn't say easy, but easier. Um, so we eventually got connected with a wholesaler who sells us the mud and ships it right to us um, because they, they use it for lots of other products. The water from Mount Everest, when I first was looking for, I'd call any phone number in Nepal that I could get a hold of. And eventually I got connected to a climbing group. Like if you wanted to go climb Everest, you wouldn't just go and go by yourself. You would like, you'd pay a team of Sherpas to help you climb Everest um and guides and um so we essentially employ a team of sherpas to climb everest uh collect the water and ship it for us wow now have you been to either of those places the dead sea or mount everest i've been to the dead sea many times Uh, i have yet to been to everest it's kind of like everyone always asks me that i never went at the beginning and so i feel like There will be a point in the future when it is time to go, uh, but not yet. 
Okay. Fair enough. So the first question that I usually ask people to really dive into the conversation is what's the hardest thing that you've ever had to handle? So a circumstance in life that you didn't get to choose for the sake of this episode, I'm almost wondering if we talk about your highest point ever and your lowest point ever. Um, and I don't know if you have those kind of uh, ready or if you need to think a little bit, but I'd be curious to hear. Yeah, I, um, I'll start with the lows. I, I think in, in life so far, it has been uh, the passing of my grandfather from Alzheimer's. Um, and in business, as a young entrepreneur, young CEO, I think it was having team members quit on me. Um, highs, I would say uh, it's that's ironic because it's the flip side of life. But uh, the birth of my two sons, I have a three and a half year old and a two year old. Um, and then in business, a high, you know, I think it's um, I think right now is is a high uh, for me. And it's not because we are making the most money we've ever made, but it is because I think I've finally like started to actually live my brand's message of finding balance, staying humble and hopeful, really caring about my team and making that the priority. Like I, I, it, it takes a while. It's taken me 10 years. June of this upcoming year will be our 10th birthday. But I feel like I finally have like gotten comfortable and love what I'm doing, even though we're making less money maybe than we've made in years in the past. Hmm. That's interesting. All right. So let's start with the passing of your grandfather. I mean, what was that season of life like for you? And did you have the perspective then that you have now um, with the highs and the lows, the humility and the hopefulness? I mean, it was the first time in life I had ever lost anyone uh, close to me. Um, and I think that was like a very life changing experience um, that you just realize that like life is life is short. And um, I think a, a perspective that it has given me that I, that I constantly think about is, OK, when it's my last day on Earth and I look back at my life, am I going to be proud about the things that I spent my time on or what am I going to regret and, and how, what am I doing now to not do those things that I would regret? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm very thoughtful about where I spend my time and how I organize my days. From a practical perspective, what does that look like? Do you schedule things out weeks in advance? Um, do you have team members who are helping you manage your time? Are there specific struggles you still have to this day, being a father and a business owner um, and, and all of those things? Yeah, I mean, I use my calendar, um, not just for work, for personal too. So like I um, a day for me is I wake up between 5 and 5.20, uh, work out before 7, because uh, the kids wake up around 7. Um, then I'm with the kids from 7 to 8, and that's like in my calendar. That's like family time. It's like in the calendar. Uh, I work till five. Usually I know we're, we're cheating it right now because we're doing it at 6 p.m. But uh, then from five to seven, I'm usually with the kids. Um, and then after seven, I'll jump back online and do a little bit more work or hang with hang with my wife. Got it. Are there times where or seasons of life where you feel completely out of balance and where do you stand on the topic of balance? Is that something that we can truly find in your opinion, or is it something that we're always working on, on managing? It's a journey. I don't think you're ever going to stay on the top or ever stay on the bottom and realizing that there are highs and lows uh, throughout that journey and just enjoying the process, I think, to the best of your ability, even in the lows, um, just knowing you'll get through it. Yeah. Helpful. Yeah. So, all right. To go back to um, your other lowest moment or moments is having people quit or leave your company. What did that actually feel like the first time that happened on a, on a personal level? Did you take it personally? Of course. Um, I, 
Yeah, I mean, I was when I when I started Loki, I was uh, 19. Right. So I was I was young, a young founder, young CEO, thought I could do it all, thought I could do every role better than everyone else. Um, and I think I micromanaged people. Um, I I just my my style of management like was more about like work 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 uh, less about like the people and how they felt. Um, and yeah, when people quit, I took it super personal. Um, and I think that view is was always how I took it, right? And it was always like a reflection of me. Um, and, and I think the biggest learning as a founder over 10 years has been focusing my priority on my team. Uh, my team is everything to me. I believe that my team will allow us to grow and be successful. And um, yeah, when, when and, and over the last couple of years, people have left, right? But it's understanding like people leave for different reasons people have other things in their life people want to try a new experience like people want to either be remote or not be remote um and it's not a personal thing and um yeah it's it's just the mindset of how you manage people yeah and so to skip ahead to this high point of life with your team and with your business you said that you feel like you're finally at a place where priorities or are in order when it comes to the team what does that look like from a practical level where are you spending your time what kind of conversations are you having uh, what does that all look like with your team yeah i mean i think it, it starts with hiring great people that share uh, uh uh the same sense of value in your mission and for us it's to help people find balance in their life uh and we believe that if our team isn't balanced, then how can we sell that mission of balance? And so, like as an example, we now have Balance Fridays, which are you know summer Fridays are uh -huh. like you end up work at like two on Fridays during the summer. So we have that all year round uh, because people need that time to go to appointments, travel, like whatever it might be. Um, and that came out of just listening to our team of of things that they really cared about uh, that we could do as an organization for them. Yeah. How, how big is your team at the moment? About 20 people and then about eight on the element side. Gotcha. And so how, how are you looking to grow? Let's say in the coming years is, is it rapidly expanding? Are you at a good place with the personnel that you have in terms of numbers? What does that look like? Yeah, you know, it's, it is hard to find great people. You want to make sure you don't burn people out. Um, so, like, as the workload and tasks and the things grow, like, you do need to hire. I, I have learned that you want – it's better to be – and this is my opinion. Someone might say the exact opposite. I would rather be late on hiring someone – make sure that role is really needed, hire the right person, no matter how long it took to find them, and then continue versus like hiring for, oh, we're going to hire this person and they're going to help a lot and it's going to grow us a lot in the future. Like I run my businesses, I try to very conservatively uh, and I care very much about the bottom line, not the top line. Um, and so, yeah, I, people like your team, I think about a lot. Yeah. Tell us about the elements side of things because we talked about loci a bit. I'm curious to hear more about elements. Yeah. So elements is a uh, plant-based beverage and supplement brand um, with clinical doses of adaptogens. We actually came up with the idea out of loci um, as another way to help people find balance in their life in an authentic way. <clears throat> we have four different SKUs energy focus calm and sleep mm. and like when you when you use the products you will definitely feel those functions um and we um yeah for me product is always number one so we needed to make sure that the product worked um we had an amazing internal team our creative directors badass 
um, and she designed an absolutely beautiful brand. And um, we quickly learned that beverages and supplements are not the same as selling bracelets. Uh, and so we ended up splitting the two companies. So Elements is a separate uh, entity um, with, with some shared resources. But then we really went out and hired a uh, executive team that had been in the beverage industry, logistics, sales for 30 plus years and um, really lean on them for their expertise and what they know best. Got it. What's your creative director's name? Caitlin Bradley. Caitlin, if you're listening to this, keep up the great work. And if you're not Caitlin Bradley, don't go steal her. I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> even, if, even if you tried, I don't think she would leave. <laughs> awesome. Oh, I see why you hesitated. Yeah, we could just, we'll call her Caitlin. I could bleep out the rest. Um, <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so, all right. Our, me... our whole team's amazing, Not, but yeah. Um, well, so let me ask you this in terms of the family side of things, you mentioned that one of the high points was, uh, the birth of your two sons. You said three and how old is the, is the second one? Two. Three and a half and two. You must have your hands full. <laughs> oh yeah. What are some of the struggles and what are some of the joys of being a parent to, uh, two young boys? I mean, the joys are easy. It's like, you're watching, you're watching, a part of you grow again and every experience that they have, you get to have through a new lens. Um, and that's really special. I, I think the biggest challenge is I care a lot about spending time with them, right? Like that's a priority to me. Um, I always put family first. And so for me, that means like call it 30% of my time. So I have 30% less time now to sleep and to work and to work out. And so how do you become more efficient with your time, not spend your time working on or doing silly things, doing the things at work that move the needle the most versus doing work to do work. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely, I there is no negative to the kids except for, the time that you spend with them obviously gets taken away from something else. Mm. So I'm going to ask a selfish question because uh, Project Endure is almost a year and a half old. I am married, no kids, maybe soon to be dog, dog dad. Um, and balancing my time is challenging. It's probably the biggest challenge that I have. And what you said really resonated was spending your time on things that move the needle how have you navigated that process and, and begun to understood, you know, this moves the needle and this is just work for the sake of work. Has that just been a messy learning process over the past 10 years? Have you had any realizations that have been helpful in those 10 years? Yeah, I would say the two things, um, one, which might not be helpful for you, um, which is like, trust your team. Right. If you're a young entrepreneur, you probably don't have a team or many people, but it's trust your team and let them do their jobs. And they'll probably do it better than you could do it. But if you're not worried about what they're doing, you can focus on other things. Um, and then for me, like I always try to pause periodically, like look at what I'm spending my time on, make a list of what are the things that are going to move the needle the most, and then just start at the top. And Whatever doesn't make the day falls off, but it's okay because it was less important than the things that I did do. Um, so it's just kind of prioritizing every day with those things that you could do that day that would make the biggest difference. Yeah. I, I love the concept of the delayed gratification. And I think one of the things that's hard for me is understanding the difference between okay, I'm going to do these things, you know, for this period of time. And I might not see a return right now, but down the road, there's going to be a compound effect where all of a sudden all that work, you know, kicks in um, versus things that actually are just not moving the needle. Do you have any of those things at Loci and Elements or just in your own personal life that, um, you know, maybe there's not a big return right now, but down the road, you are expecting a big return. So you continue to do those things. Yeah, I think it's um, not cutting corners and doing everything the right way. 
Um, I, I think you you constantly hear stories of unicorn companies or like sometimes maybe you look and your competitor is like doing a huge marketing campaign or someone's growing so much faster than you. Um, and I think you can get distracted by those things and using those things to determine what you do, I think could be a, can be a really dangerous path to go on. Mm -hmm. I think to really build a successful company, you can't cut corners and you have to build a great foundation. Um, and sometimes that's slower um, or it's more expensive in some ways. Um, but you're spending time and dollars the right way. And so, yeah, does that answer your question? Absolutely. Um, is entrepreneurship the hardest thing that you've ever chosen for yourself on purpose? Yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> if you don't, if I could never see myself doing anything else. Like I am a serial entrepreneur through and through. Um, but it is not for the faint of heart. Like you got to really be able to stomach some crazy highs and some crazy lows. So let's talk about it. And just with the context of my entrepreneurship journey started long before I left my full-time job. I think it's always been in me in middle school. I actually got in trouble for selling gum. I'd buy a pack of gum for a dollar and then sell each piece for 25 cents. And it was a great business model, but just uh, not allowed within the confines of the school. Anyway, um, I, I started having a seed planted again, let's say two and a half, three years ago. I was around a lot of entrepreneurs and I kept asking, you know, what what's the best part of this? And they would say, well, the best part is that I am in complete control. I have ownership. They The, the word ownership got thrown around. They would also say, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, hands down. Some days you wake up and you're on top of the world and the next day you feel like you got run over by a bus and you have to just get back up and keep walking forward. And the more and more that I heard that in some kind of sick way, the more appealing it was to me um, because I saw this opportunity for not only professional growth, but personal growth to be able to manage those highs and those lows. And I'll say firsthand that I agree with you 100% the highs and the lows of entrepreneurship are unlike almost anything else that I've ever experienced. And they've made me a better person, not just a better business person, but a better person. So I'm curious for you what some of those lessons have been like, how you continue to manage the highs and the lows, and if you have any suggestions for people who are maybe venturing into entrepreneurship. Yeah, that's um, a lot. Yeah. Um, I think, I think it, uh, one, being an entrepreneur humbles you a lot um and, and second i would say if you are go if you're thinking about being an entrepreneur because being an entrepreneur is cool and trendy and you're not passionate about what you are going into like you won't survive because you need to be so passionate that you can run through brick walls and beat the odds most companies fail right and that's just like a fact so um, are, are you willing to do whatever it takes in the early days to really get that momentum and get going? Um, surround yourself with other like-minded people. Um, every single one of my close friends, and I keep my circle of friends very small, are entrepreneurs doing the same thing. We, we collaborate we tell stories, good stories, bad stories. We support each other. Um, you need to have an amazing kind of group around you, um, especially if you're a solo entrepreneur and don't have a co-founder. What's the What's the hardest decision you've ever had to make in business? Letting people go. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, it's part of the job for sure. Uh, like, I, I, it's impossible to build and run a company and not let people go. Um, I think you have to do it in a fair way. You have to make sure things are expectations are set up ahead of time. And they under, and if it comes to that, they understand why. Um, but yeah, you're, and, and this is a lesson I've just learned as I've gotten older and had children Right. Like 
you're you're messing with someone's life and and their income uh, and what the bills that they have to pay. Um, and so, yeah, don't do that lightly. Yeah, man, that's that's got to be so tough. And on the flip side, it, it's got to be so amazing to share in the joy of watching people grow um, as part of your team, um, to grow with them together toward a common goal. Um, yeah. Well, so let me ask you this question to shift gears a little bit. We've talked a lot about business, about life, about family a little bit. You mentioned that you exercise in the morning each day. And I'm mm -hmm. curious what your fitness uh, experience looks like and, and how that plays into everything else. So what are your morning workouts look like and what has your fitness journey been like in general? Yeah. I mean, I, when I work out versus don't work out, my mind is different. I can feel it. You know, it's like not any time of day. Right. So if I need to, I'll like, like this morning, I actually didn't work out, but after this, I am going to go for a run. Um, but I usually either run cycle or, uh, go to the gym and lift. Um, and I think doing it first thing in the morning for me is like, I just tackled the hardest physical thing I'm going to have to do all day. I already feel like I checked that box and I kind of can hit the day running with a big thing out of the way. Um, so that's that for me, it's feeling good, feeling healthy, which is probably something I do take for granted because I ran track in college. Like I've pretty much worked out my entire life and always have felt good and healthy. But the mindset of like, I'm going to attack the day, be up before everyone else, be up like, I'm going to beat you today to the gym. Uh, I take that with me. Are you a competitive guy? Just a bit. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't tell. Don't, uh, don't. Don't, don't let the humble hopeful fool you. I want to crush everyone that I go against. <laughs> I think you kind of need that uh, in the world of business. Uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that's a necessity. Yeah, you, you got you to gotta have a... I, I think you have to have an edge of competition and like grit. Like you, you don't have to be a bad person or a mean person, uh, but you are you're fighting for the consumer dollars. You're fighting for shelf space. Like you, you are going against other people, whether you like it or not. Yeah, yeah, that's the truth. And at the same time, it sounds like you're collaborating with other people with your circle. Yeah, it, yeah, it, like to totally and. You can you can compete with people in a fair way, right? But um, yeah, I look at it as a as a very like I want to I want to beat you. Yeah, mindset. So looking forward in business, then is there an end goal or is there a, an ultimate vision for any of the ventures that you're involved with? Um. I did not start Loci thinking I'm going to start this business because I want to sell it to make a lot of money. I started it because of the purpose and the reason and the mission. And I don't think that Loci would still exist today if that was not the reason. Um, because of like we talked about, the crazy highs and crazy lows you go through. Um, and if you are just starting a company to sell it, you're already in the wrong mindset because like that getting to the end is like one and so hard. And two, I, like I've, I have friends that have sold companies. They're not happy when they sell it. It's never a happy moment. So it's about the journey. And so for me, I will not say I will never sell Lokai. I, I tend to feel that maybe I will never sell it. Um, but I'm just really enjoying what I'm doing, growing it, building the company and, and giving back. Uh, Lokai donates 10% of profits to charity. Uh, and we've donated a little over $9.4 million to different nonprofit organizations 
since we launched in 2013. Wow. That's really cool. So speaking of kind of the journey of business, looking forward, it requires endurance. And this is the Project Endure podcast. So I ask every guest, what does the word endurance mean to you? It's a great question. Um, I could do this for 50 years, right? So like the way that I live my life, allocate my time, like work, I could do this same thing for the next 50 years. I think um, when you're young, or, or I don't want to say young, because at any age you can be an entrepreneur, but uh, when you're early, just starting, just creating your product, yeah, you might need to grind a little bit harder. Like I slept in the office when I, when I was first getting Lokai going. Um, but at, besides that, like very, very early phase, I think you have to figure out a way of living your life and building your company that feel balanced. Because if you just work till three in the morning every night, woke up at five in the morning, and you're like, grind, grind, grind. Like you could do that for a week, a month, like maybe a year, but you'll just burn out and get exhausted. Um, and that's not the mindset that I have. So yeah, I, I, I've I built my life and my schedule in a way to endure uh, and do this forever. Thinking of life and just understanding the highs and the lows and just the fact that you know, life's not fair and we can't predict what happens tomorrow. You know, the next time you do get thrown off track and um, you're either thrown into a really high high or a really low low, do you have any idea of a strategy or, or a way that you would try to get back on track? Because I imagine there are people listening who just yesterday, life was kind of on this steady path. And this morning they found out some news or something happened and um, life just got thrown out of balance. Do you have any tips or suggestions for somebody in that space? I would say get back on your routine as fast as you can. Um, like sometimes, like I know this is small, right? But like Monday night football or Sunday night football, like I usually go to bed at 9, 930. But sometimes you're like, no, I'm just going to stay up and watch the game tonight. And like then I wake up in the morning exhausted. And I'm like, what did I, why did I do that to myself? Like I told myself I need to go to sleep at this time. And that's like a tiny, tiny one, but no one's perfect. Everyone falls off of their normal routine, normal schedule from a big thing or a small thing. But if like, even if I stay up late that night, using that tiny example, I still try to wake up early and work out. So try to get, I try to stay on my schedule as much as I can. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think in general action, um, action helps steady us. Um, when things are all out of whack and we feel overwhelmed or confused, if we can get back to that routine and continue to put one foot in front of the other, I think life tends to sort itself out. Um, so I love that. So I have a few more questions, but one that I've never asked anybody before on the podcast, and it just came to me. Uh, at the end of your life, when you are on your deathbed and you look back, do you have one big fear or one big regret that you're uh, concerned that you might be faced with at the end of your life that you really want to make sure doesn't happen? Yes, I have thought about that. Uh, and my biggest fear is that I don't fulfill the potential that I had. Mm. Tell me more. I, I just, I love this topic. I want to hear more. What is, what does your potential look like? Do you even know what your potential looks like? Not really. Um, I, I know family first, right? That's like everything to me. Um, if that's not successful, uh, nothing else to me matters. Um, yeah. And then on the business side and I don't know. All right, let me put it this way. I think it would be hard to know if I, if, yeah. I don't, I don't think there's an answer. I was just curious what you were going to say. Um, I'm curious though, if, if you lost, say Loki and, and, and Element uh, had to go away, right? Like just tomorrow, right? 
there was something that happened. You couldn't do those things anymore. What would you do? What would you do next? We take a deep breath. I would take probably a little bit of time off and I'd start another company. Do you think you'll ever be retired in, in the way people no. picture? Back? No. I, I love this. Do you think you'll encourage your kids to become entrepreneurs in some way, shape, or form? My grandfather was, my dad was, I am, but I like I was never pushed into it. I think the one of the greatest things that my father ever did was um from a young age told me I would never take over his business. Uh so I always had to kind of figure it out on my own. Um, and I, I feel the same way about my kids and whether they become entrepreneurs or do something else, I, I really don't care what they choose as long as they're passionate and, uh, like put, give their all to whatever they do. Yeah. Yeah. You guys planning on having more? No, two's enough. We're done. I've heard that if you plan on three, if you don't do it quickly enough, then, you know, it's kind of out the window just because two is a handful. We, we were between two and three before we had any kids. And then once we had one, we're like, well, let's, let's have one more like quickly and then be done. Yeah. Um, all right. A few more questions. What's the best piece of advice that you've ever received? When I told my dad the idea for Lokai, he said, that's a great idea, but everyone has great ideas. Now I go execute it. Uh, it's all about execution. Mm. what did execution look like at the beginning right it's just a concept your dad tells you that what does that look like for me yeah. it was googling how do you find a factory in china seriously like it's that simple like it was that simple and and i think today with social media reaching out to people google like there's no excuse that you can't figure out how to do something. Yeah. And you, you made a lot of phone calls. It sounds like to Nepal for one, and I'm sure a bunch of other places. And there's a level of persistence that needs to go into that. Um, in time, I, uh, I worked on Lokai for three years in college and then like two years after college before it, quote unquote, blew up. Mm. So it was like five years in to working on it before it saw success. Did you have moments where you thought maybe I should just hang this up and this isn't going to work out? Never. I never doubted the idea or myself once. Has the mission of Lokai changed over time? It has not. It has always been to inspire people to find balance in life. Mm. I think it the 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 bracelet is a physical manifestation of that mission, so it is very directly tied. I think the way that I carry my <clears throat> the way that I carry myself as a CEO in the relationships with vendors, my team, external people has definitely become more in line with the mission. Mm. Were there seasons of life where you felt out of alignment with the mission of Lokai, yet you were still pushing forward? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, I got to like, I got tired of Lokai. Like there were, there was like a few years, like I call it like three or four years ago, where I was like, the, it's it's one of those things. The grass is always greener, right? Like you always think there's more out there. And um, to be totally honest with you, like that's kind of the start of where Elements came from, because I, because I wanted to do more and do something different, um, and actually starting elements has made me realize how much I love Lokai and the mission and everything it stands for. So I still love elements as well. Um, and, and 
it, they're incredible products that my my mission, which is for elements similar to loci in helping people find balance, but I want to do it for the masses. So I want to make like health and wellness accessible to everyone. Um, so like I'm just as passionate about elements as I am loci, but yeah, th those years like I was searching for more, but um, not anymore. That's so interesting that as soon as you created that other thing that you were hoping to maybe reignite a spark, um, you realize that the spark was actually still for loci. Um, I think that's, that's cool. I mean, life is full of those kind of things where, right. To create a company all about balance in the beginning, you almost had, had to be out of balance, right? There's this duality of life where, you know, yeah. you can be two different things that seem like they're on polar opposites of the spectrum at the same time. And I'd love to just hear for a few minutes your take on the concept of balance in general before I kind of wrap us up with the final question. And you can go anywhere you want with this, by the way. Yeah, I, I think a big misconception of the word balance is like average. Um, I think if you are filling your like cup, let's call it, um, in different parts of your life, family, fitness, creativity, business, like they compound. And, and I think the better I get at some, it makes me better at others. Um, and I want to be great at doing all of those things, not just average, but do them all. So that's how I view balance. Um, and I notice it, like if I don't work out, I'm not as good of a father, not as good as a husband. I get more irritated at work. Uh, so yeah, I think you can be great at all of those things all at once, whatever those are for you. Mm. Yeah. And it's been said before that it's better to be good at something in a consistent fashion over a long period of time than on occasion to be great at one thing and then to be not so great at it at other times. And it's true. Consistent effort compounds. Um, and I'm glad to hear that's a big part of your, your balance definition. So, uh, Steven, as we wrap things up this last question, and just for anybody listening, this conversation went pretty differently than a lot of previous conversations in terms of order of questions and conversation. And we jumped from place to place. Um, but we're going to wrap it up with the same question. And that question is simply, you know, if somebody's going through a tough time in life, if they're feeling a little overwhelmed, out of balance, stuck, frustrated, lost, whatever it is, um, whether they chose to be in this position or life kind of brought them there, what would you say to them? And before you answer, I want you to think that maybe someday one or both of your boys are going to be needing this kind of advice and that they are in this position where they need you to tell them, hey, hey, dad, I don't, I don't know what to do right now. Um, what do you say to them? Yeah, I would say two really big things. One is stay hopeful, right? I think um, when you, like big or small, you're going through highs and lows throughout life and you need to keep on and hold on to that hope. If you don't, then like you're going to struggle to get through whatever you're going through. Um, and, and, Second, I would say is perspective, um, like give back. Yeah, even if you're going through a hard time, like what can you do to give back to others? Um, understanding what other people are going through in life can make your situation feel a lot smaller or a lot less important than you might think it is. I love both of those. I have two quotes. I think go well with um, the hopeful and the humble. I'm going to go with the humble one first. So this is Ernest Hemingway. And he once said, um, there is nothing noble in being superior to your fellow man. True nobility is being superior to your former self. And while we can compete with those around us, to me, being humble means understanding that you're not necessarily better or worse than other people. It's you versus you every single day. That's where potential is. That's where regret lives. 
comparison is the thief of joy. All of those things apply. And then on the hopeful side, my favorite quote, which is the message behind my only tattoo, sometimes when you're in a dark place, you think that you've been buried, but you've actually been planted. And that's Christine Kane. And I love the mix of the hopeful and humble. Um, and I really appreciate your message, Stephen, big time. Thank you. I love those quotes. This is uh, this has been one of my favorite podcasts to be on. Ah, thank you, man. I appreciate yeah. that. If people want to find out more about you, more about the companies, um, where should they go to do that? Yeah, they can go to lokai.com, L-O-K-A-I.com. Um, and then elementsofbalance.io for the drinks and supplements. You can also find both on Amazon. We all have an Amazon account. Just quickly go check them out and swipe. And if people want to connect with you, Stephen, uh, where should they do that? On Instagram at Stephen Eisen. Nice. You got the Stephen Eisen. Nobody took that. Got that. It's pretty good. Um, well, thank you again, man. I'm wishing you the best of luck with everything. Looking forward to staying in touch. And I know this conversation is going to reach many people who need it. Thank you so much, Joe. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor Podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing, if you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.